Okay, recording started. Uh, right, any questions before we go to the next chapter? Uh, we've completed chapter two. Shall we go to the next chapter? Any thoughts, any questions? Okay. All right, let's move to chapter three. Let me just project the notes. OK, so we'll go to chapter three, understanding blood covenant. Now, if we read the Old Testament, we can understand that the blood covenant is the most powerful covenant that the Lord initiated. Right Now, we established the fact that uh, covenant is serious binding agreement between two parties. It's a biblical covenant. It's a promise. It's firm. It's unbreakable. Every covenant has these aspects. But what is a blood covenant? Right? When we see the word biblically, the covenant means to cut covenant. It's an agreement that involves shedding of blood. Right? A blood covenant is the highest form of covenant that can be made. Right Now, we look at uh, the example of the covenant that God made with Abraham. Uh, before that, just a few aspects of the blood covenant. When we enter into a blood covenant with somebody, right, in, in the Old Testament, uh, maybe two people entered into a blood covenant, it was binding until death, and in some cases, continuing through generations. Right? Uh, so, for example, just an example, right? Uh, so, for example, if two men in the Old Testament uh, said, okay, I want to, uh, I, 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 through this blood covenant, uh, I will want to make sure that um, the land that I have and the, the, the camels and the flock that I have will go to you and your next generation as well. So, if it's binding by blood, it is the strongest covenant that is made. Right? It's just an example. A blood covenant is with someone is a promise that you'll give them your life. That is all that you are, are available to them. If there comes a point when you have to give your life for the other person, you should be willing to go do it. Why? Because it's a blood covenant. Two, it is your love. You'll do anything for them at any cost. Right? We cannot, you know, say no. I don't want to do this because, you know, I, uh, uh, you know, I, I prefer doing it for somebody else. No, no. Uh, if we have partaked in that blood covenant, we have to be willing to let go of anything uh, for our life and uh, for love. We have to do anything for them. Third one is protection to protect them, no matter what it costs. You protect the other person until either one of them is uh, dies right so we see that this covenant has it's it's like a give all covenant nothing to hold back right you have to give it all right well both parties must be willing to give all that they have for this covenant so that is why it is the most powerful binding covenant right uh, and this covenant is ratified which means comes into effect only with the sealing of blood, right? And we look at what God told Abraham to do and how the first blood covenant was established. Uh, but the covenant is backed up by your life. Now, violation of that covenant will cost life, right? Uh, so, for, for example, in the old covenant, if somebody broke a blood covenant, it could cost life, right? Uh, so let's look at the blood covenant that God initiated with Abraham. Abraham believed God. It was credited to him as righteousness. He obeyed God. Genesis 15, 1 to 6, we see how God called uh, Abraham, gave him this wonderful promise and this wonderful covenant. Let's read Genesis chapter 15, 1 to 6. Yes, one of us, please read that. Uh, 
Can I read? Yes, please go ahead. Genesis chapter 15, 1 to 6. After these things, the word of God came to Abraham in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, <clears throat> Abraham. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abraham said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house, Elysia of Damascus? Then Abraham said, Look, you have given me no offering. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars. If you are able to number them, and he said to him, so shall your descendants be. Amen. Amen. Uh, that's verse 6 also. And he believed in the Lord. I'm sorry. <laughs> and he believed in the Lord, and he acted. He accounted it to him for righteousness. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. So this is a wonderful promise that God has given. We all know the story of how God called Abraham. God's telling Abraham, look, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. And to that, Abraham is responding, God, right now, I don't have an offspring. I don't have an heir. Right now, the heir to everything that I have is Eliezer of Damascus. This person who's not my offspring, right now he's heir to it. Uh, how is it that I'm going to be a father to many nations? Now, here's an important thing that I'd like you to see. God is, ref here the word is still Abram, right? And we'll get to when he calls him Abraham, right? Uh, and then, verse 3, Abraham, then Abraham said, look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, this one shall not be your heir, but the one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Now, this is the promise that God gave Abraham, right? But how does he establish this promise? How does he establish this covenant? God doesn't just he doesn't just say it and, you know, he can do it, right? God can just say and it will be done. But God is being so practical also. And he's saying, listen, I, this is what I've said. You will be a father of many nations. Now, let me do my part of the covenant by ratifying or confirming or uh, endorsing or bringing into force what I have just said. And so what does God tell Abraham to do? Let's read uh, from verse 7 onwards, 15, verse 7 to 21. It's a big passage, but it's important that we read the entirety of it. Yes, go ahead. Any one of us? 15, 7 to 21. Genesis 15, 7 to 21. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? So he said to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these to him and cut them in two, down the middle, and placed each piece opposite the other. But he did not cut the birds in two. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abraham, and behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Then he said to Abraham, Then he said to Abraham, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them. 
and they will afflict them 400 years. And also the nation whom they serve, I will judge. Afterward, they will come out with great possessions. Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. And it came to pass, when the sun went down and it was dark, that, behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. On the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, To your descendants I have given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Gigashites and the Jebusites. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you for reading that portion. Right. So God made the promise. Was 7 to 21. God is ratifying, confirming the promise. He says to Abraham, okay, Abraham, listen, I brought you out to this land now. I'm going to continue to be with you. I've given you the promise. Verse 9, bring me a tree year old heifer, a three year old female goat, a three year old ram, and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. So bring all these here and cut them and be ready. And when the vultures came, Abraham was probably, you know, chasing them away. But what happened? Verse 12, when the sun was going down, he fell into a deep sleep, right? And then the Lord God himself was 17 and it came to pass when the sun went down it was dark and behold there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces here we see that god himself ratifying confirming and passing by the the offering that abraham had laid out now it's so wonderful to see that when God is making this covenant, yes, he tells Abraham, listen, listen, Abraham, you're going to do be a father of many nations and this, uh, and uh, you're going to be a blessing and all of that. But he also says some things. He says, look, uh, verse 16, uh, sorry, not verse 16, verse 13. Then he said to Abraham, know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and will serve and they will afflict them for 400 years. So he's also telling them, God is telling Abraham, I've blessed you. You will be a blessing. Your, your offspring will be a blessing. But there will be a time when your people, the, the people that who are in covenant, will be in bondage for 400 years. And that's what happened. right? Uh, 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 and God used Moses to bring them out. And what do we, we see here? On the same day, the Lord, verse 18, made a covenant with Abraham. He, he passed through the offering. He walked through that offering. His presence just moved in that place, ratifying and confirming that offering. It's wonderful to see in Genesis 17, you know, God tells Abraham, you will no longer be called Abraham, but you will be called Abraham, the father of many nations. And he says to Sarai, you'll no longer be called Sarai, but you'll be called Sarah. When God calls us into a covenant, he changes our identity. Right? And that's what he's doing even now. Second Corinthians 5.17 says, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. It's a new identity. You're a new person. There's a new nature. There are new attributes. Why? Because the presence of God is working in and through us. I'm sure Abraham must have felt really excited after coming down that mountain thinking, oh, finally I'm going to have a child. I'm going to have my own offspring. And as God promised, He will. it will be a blessing to the generation and the generations. And maybe Abraham is coming down that mountain you know, just an awe of God and what he and the promise that God gave him. But little did Abraham know that he would have to wait for 25 years for that promise to come come through. 
that's where we see the faith of Abraham. Probably Abraham thought year after year, when is this covenant going to come to pass? The Bible teaches us that Abraham did not diminish in faith. He continued because maybe I believe that this picture of God himself walking through the offering, through the sacrifice and making a blood covenant, maybe that was in his mind. He said, no, if God himself has said it, it will be done. So sometimes, even in our lives, covenants God, God has made for us. And when we align ourselves into that covenant, we may have to wait. We may have to walk in faith. But remember that the day God told Abraham, you'll change your name from Abram to Abraham, his identity was changed. That day, it was not after 25 years, okay, God came to Abraham and said, okay, remember Abraham, 25 years back, I met you on that mountain. At that time you were Abram. Now you change your name to Abraham. No, no. On that day itself, he says, you will be called Abraham. You will have a new identity. You will have a new nature. And after he changes their names as a new identity, he also gives them a sign, a token, a memorial of that covenant, a circumcision, which is a seal that is even followed even now, uh, especially by many Jews, circumcision. Let's read Genesis chapter 17, 10 to 11. Genesis 17, 10 and 11. Go ahead. Can I? Yes, go ahead, please. Genesis chapter 17, verse 10 and 11. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins. And it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. Right. Amen. Thank you, Rosalind. Right. So we see a pattern that God is following, right? First, he calls Abraham. Two, he makes a covenant with Abraham. Three, he binds that covenant as a blood covenant. Four, he changes their identity and their nature. Abraham may be coming down that mountain, may, be, may have been thinking, okay, I'm going to have a child. He went up that mountain not knowing what's going to happen. But he came down with a new identity, with a new name, with a new nature. And fifthly, God is saying, I've made this covenant, so there is going to be a sign and a seal, not only for you, but for the generations to come. If you follow this, if you have this seal, you are expressing your belief in my covenant with Abraham. Right now, what happened when after Genesis 17, 10 and 11 says, this is my covenant. You shall keep every male child among you shall be circumcised and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. So after being circumcised, especially in the old covenant, what is it that you and I get? What are the benefits or the blessings that we are aligning ourselves, uh, uh, you know, for uh, in this covenant? Let's look at some of them. First one, God called Abraham a friend of God. The ultimate purpose of God's covenant with us is to have a relationship. We looked at it in chapter one. These covenants are not so that we can fill up pages in the Bible. Or these covenants are not so that, you know, God has certain, you know, uh, commands and no. The whole point of this covenant that God made with Abraham was to have a relationship. When we align ourselves into this covenant, just like Abraham, Abraham was called a friend of God. When we align ourselves in God's covenant, we can say, God, we are called your friend. 
Genesis 18, 17, and the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? God was so open. It was a, it was a relationship that had been established. God reveals to Abraham what he was planning to do. Right? He tells Abraham, this is what, is going, what I'm going to do ahead. And, and, and that's what, uh, you know, Abraham's test. We see here the covenant that Abraham walked in obedience to, that we just spoke about, about Isaac and how he took Isaac up that mountain. What happened after that? Abraham, you see, God is revealing himself in different aspects to Abraham. God, Abraham probably had a deeper revelation of God being the Jehovah Jireh. Genesis 22, 13 and 14. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked. And there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram, and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. What a, what a picture this would have been. When we see Abraham heartbroken, taking up his own son up that mountain. But the moment God spoke to him and said, stop Abraham, look at the ram, take it and burn it as an offering. Just picture, picture the joy that Abraham would have seen in his heart. He would have felt caught. You are really Jehovah Jireh, a deeper revelation. He's already seen the revelation of God. He's already seen that in his old age, when he was 100 years old, God gave him a child. That was already a revelation for him. But when this event happened, Jehovah Jireh became a deeper revelation of who God is. And that is why, you know, as believers, more than you know just reading the word and and you know uh, uh just you know okay i have to read one chapter two chapters this day more than that it's stronger when we ask god to give us a revelation of who he is you know i've i've said this and i say it again john three sixteen is a wonderful verse probably quoted it many 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 times but it really becomes a revelation in my heart when i had my son and i thought to myself god gave his only son for us a deeper revelation and there are many many scriptures uh, that we can look at and say god you came and and you did all of this it brings a new revelation in our heart, a new meaning of who God is. Right? When we probably read uh, the New Testament, it brings up so much, so such great revelations of who God is, right? Of His love, of His grace, His mercies, His of of who He is, such a wonderful God. He goes on to say, by myself, I have sworn. So God backs up his covenant with himself. Just like what we did in chapter one. We saw that God himself is backing up that covenant. He's not sending an angel. He's not sending uh, seraphims or cherubims or anyone else to back up the covenant. But he's saying, I will back up this covenant. Let's read Genesis 22, 15 to 18. Yes, one of us, please read this. Let's go ahead. Genesis 22, 15 to 18. Genesis 22, 15 to 18. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing. Pastor, it went. Oh, sorry, sorry. Thank you. Oh, okay. 
and said, verse 16, and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. Blessing, I will bless you, and multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Amen. So thank you, Rosalind. So God here is saying, I am backing up the covenant and, and said, by myself, I have sworn, says the Lord. So God himself is saying, by myself, I, I, am, I am standing on this covenant. I'm not going to send anybody else. Nobody else. I'm going to stand for the covenant. Hebrews 6, 13 to 15. For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself the highest form of making a covenant. He says, I, I, by myself, I will swear it. Verse 14, saying, surely blessing, I will bless you and multiplying. I will multiply you. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. I love that verse, verse 13. For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, no one greater, because God knows that he's the greatest and he's the only one who can back up the covenant. Now, even as we look at our lives and our covenants, and, and we are part of the messianic covenant and everything that the Lord has done. Remember, he is backing up himself for the covenant. And we pray and say, God, your word says that you will bring restoration. We say, Lord, you said that you will bring healing. God, you said that you will uh, you know, uh, grant me peace and comfort. Lord, you said that uh, you will make me the head and not the tail. What are we doing? We are standing on what God has said for us, what he has sworn as a promise to us. And so we're not saying something out of the blue, but we're saying, God, you, you have said it. And since you have said it, you are the one who is, you know, standing for this covenant. So you have to do it. Now, here's an important point to remember. Just because, you know, uh, it's not like we, we are holding God's hand, uh, twisting God's hand and saying, no, you have to do it because I'm part of the covenant. No. God has his ways. Like we, we saw uh, how he worked with Abraham. God told Abraham, I will make you a blessing. But there was, there was this whole waiting period. Right? God made, him, God made Abraham wait. God made him go through that season of waiting. So again, just because if we are we are part of the covenant, there will be times God will take us through seasons, through trainings, through uh, seasons of learning. And, and through those seasons of learning, God will bring revelation to our hearts. Amen. God will bring revelation to our hearts. Right. So uh, I don't want to move on from uh to the next portion what we'll do is we'll stop here uh if do you have any questions any thoughts anybody has any questions on this covenant is it uh, uh is it something that you're able to understand you know as we move on from the covenants uh, to the cross we'll also see how uh, you know, God fulfilled his promise through the cross and what the blood of Jesus is doing, has done and is doing in our lives. So uh, any, anything else anyone would like to share? Any thoughts? I know a lot of Old Testament uh, material, but it's very important uh, because these are uh, promises that hold fast even now. Uh, you know, the names of God and all that we've learned, it holds fast even now. So. Okay, so no questions, no thoughts? All right. Okay, uh, let's let's uh, take some time uh, and close in prayer. Uh, maybe two of us, if two of us can close in prayer, uh, just thank God for, you know, 
that he has called us into a covenant right even we were yet sinners christ died for us and he has called us and also let's pray that god will enable us to align ourselves uh, to the covenant that he has called us for right that we may not be in a hurry uh, that we may have faith walk in obedience and we know that whatever he said in his covenant he himself is backing it up and so it will come to pass in our lives so maybe two of us uh, can just pray and close this time yes. go ahead any two of us Any, any two of us uh, can just yes. pray. Can I, can I start? Go ahead, Isaac. Father, Lord in heaven, we want to thank you for your mercies and your revelation. We accept and we know that your word is here and amen. We thank you for the word that you have spoken. And we pray that we revelation we take seed in our heart. And as humans, we guide us to God's all feelings that we align ourselves to the covenant and not be covenant breakers, but be covenant keepers so that we will be able to endure the patience that you gave to Abraham so that we'll be able to endure, learn more so that we'll be a seed that will germinate and provide fruits so that the kingdom will be go ahead and prosper. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. 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 Anyone else? Yeah. Just lead, close in prayer. Pray that, you know, we can all uh, align ourselves and the Lord will empower us to fulfill our side of the covenant because we know God will. Uh, thank God for everything that we have learned. Thank God for His for who He is all the all the nature that he reveals himself to each one of us in different seasons of our lives so let's just lift up our hearts with gratitude and thank the lord one last person go ahead father we pray that we would be able to walk according to your word lord jesus as we heard today help us to walk in that understanding that you are a covenant God and you continue to keep your covenant oh God and we thank you that you have enabled us to be partakers of your covenant Lord we thank you for the revelation of covenant Lord Jesus we pray oh God that even as we live our life forward help us to experience all of your covenant names to be manifested in our lives in a special way Lord we pray oh God that we would experience the fullness of what you have finished at the cross and the fullness of your name through your covenant, Lord Jesus, in, in, our, in our lives and in our hearts, oh God. We thank you for being our sanctifier. We thank you for being our healer. We thank you for being our provider. We thank you for being our father, Lord. We pray that we will continue to experience you, Lord Jesus. We thank you for teaching us this wonderful revelation today, God. We praise you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, uh, Isaac. Thank you, John, for uh, closing in prayer. Thank you, each one of you. Uh, have a great week ahead. Uh, do spend some time uh, reading whatever we have studied. Uh, we'll catch up next week. Have a great week. God bless.